sounds good. I'll interrupt you. Yeah, so as, as Lauren said, I'm, I'm Lindsey Kwam. I'm the Deputy State Forester for New Mexico and the Tribal Liaison. I've been in um, the New Mexico Forestry Division for a little over 15 years. I've also worked in um, uh, government and also state uh, tribal government as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the resources and some of the work that we in the Forestry Division do. Um, something that's familiar to all of you, I think, is wildfires. Um, these are quotes over my 23 year career that I've heard type one incident commanders, um, type one operations folks stating this year after year in all the 23 years I've worked in, in, in forestry profession. I keep hearing these things over and over again and we're gonna continue to keep hearing these things over and over again because it's not gonna get any better. I think the one thing that I really agree with is this, this is the new norm. It really is, but it doesn't have to be across the board because we have proof out there. This was a fire from 2022 in the Hamas Mountains. Um, the main fire was in that red circle that was called, it's um, untreated. Um, there was a finger that burned down to the south or to the bottom of the pay, uh, bottom of the picture into the yellow. That was a treated and piled um, area. The little blue dot is actually a treated and burnt area. The head of the fire stopped once it hit that blue dot. That fire, once it hit the blue dot or that blue area, got down to the ground. Forces, resources were able to get on it and put it out. In the yellow, it burnt through that area and continued on forward. So we have proof that thinning and burning does work. So that's a lot of what we in the forestry division try and promote with a lot of our partners um, across the board. The way in which we do that is um, each state is required to have a forest action plan. What that is, is basically a 10 year strategy on how the state is going to manage natural resources for the state for the next 10 years. We're in year five of our 10 year plan and this is what we came up with. This was our shared, the shared stewardship initiative with the um, US Forest Service. Um, this is a busy map. I'm sorry for all the different colors, but kind of the teal greenish colors are the 10 priority landscapes that the Forest Service and, and the state decided that were the most significant landscapes in this state in terms of water resources. And uh, areas that were prone to wildland fire and that also were the most ecologically diverse across the state. And as you can see, they're all the mountain areas across the state. Um, I don't know if you guys know how much of New Mexico relies on our forests for their water. Um, can you guys guess a percentage that we get from our forests of our water? Roughly 60 to 70% we get from these watersheds there's only about 30% of actual groundwater that New Mexico gets. So these are significant areas. So our shared stewardship initiative is working with all our partners to and, and to coordinate all our efforts across these landscapes because funding's not available, contract um, resources aren't, aren't, aren't as significant as we'd like them to be. And so we all need to collectively maximize our resources to treat these areas to significantly reduce the threats to our water, our um, other natural resources, and definitely within in our um, landscapes across the state. So some of the resources that we have to offer as a state um, regarding drought impacts is what I, what I mentioned earlier on that, on that map is our forest action plan, but we also have a pretty robust urban forestry program. Um, we provide a lot of urban forestry technical assistance with several of our urban communities across the state. Um, we're seriously looking at a lot of green stormwater infrastructure to try and capture and harvest a lot of the runoff that happens when we do have storm events. Um, looking at ways and methodology and new um, 
new technologies to reduce our reliance on irrigation, to do irrigation better than what we've been doing, um, and really to reduce our heat island effects because that impacts the amount of uh, air conditioning and, and energy use that we have um, in our urban centers. We have also have a grant funding, well, it's not a grant, but a funding source that's uh, available that's called the FARA, which is our Forest and Watershed Restoration Act. It's a little over three million that we get every year to be able to put towards forest and watershed restoration, mainly um, within water resource areas across uh, forests. It's for planning, it's for implementation, prescribed burning, uh, all that good stuff. We're also delving into being able to start doing fire modeling and ignition detection um, using satellites and, and those types of technologies to detect um, fires as they, um, as they start in the initial inception of ignition so we can um, hopefully uh, verify that it is a wildfire and then hit them as fast as we can to reduce the likelihood uh, of them getting catastrophic or looking at potential to utilize them um, to, to do benefit um, in areas that we're able to do that. A new initiative that we just started in the state is we have a reforestation center that uh, New Mexico is building um, to expand the number of uh, seedlings that we can grow and put out on, on the landscape. I think when it's fully up and running by next year's estimate, um, we're hoping to have anywhere from five to 10 million seedlings a year that it can produce for reforestation efforts. We're also doing a lot of mapping and a lot of um, detection of green islands in a lot of the burnt areas so we can try and um, put forth efforts to not only protect those green islands but utilize them as um, seed sources for future forest growth. We're doing a lot of forest health impact monitoring to, to look at what a lot of these landscape fires are doing in terms of uh, insects and disease and trying to stay on top of that so we can uh, curtail or at least um, modify some of our management and planning to, to uh, reduce the impact from, from insects and disease. We're also delving into post-fire recovery, a lot of uh, res uh, restoration, um, a lot of erosion control methodologies and planning um, in a lot of the communities and forested areas that are impacted by wildfires and trying to reduce that um, erosion impact. We've also just recently um, put out a landowner prescribed burn training. Um, it's a, a course that land, any private landowner can sign up for. Um, they, it's all online. There is a bit of a classroom component, but it's not much. It allows them to be able to get qualified to do um, either uh, pile burn, um, burning on their private property or broadcast burn. Um, burning on their property. Um, and so that's something new that we're rolling out to try and um, entice people to do more prescribed burning across the landscape. We're also engaged and, and for help formulate a tribal working group because a lot of our tribal lands sit across these landscapes that are really important. Um, and they oftentimes um, aren't consulted or forgotten when we do management planning or management actions. And so this working group is um, set up by myself, the, uh, the Nature Conservancy and um, the Forest Stewards Guild to bring New Mexico tribes together and help work through different um, tribal needs um, to promote training and, and to just have a collective kind of voice for tribes so uh, we can all work together to, to help um, tribes with their, to meet their needs and, and to be able to address some of their concerns. Um, and then we've also got something called the Shared Stewardship Portal where we're working with all our partners across the state. It's a website where we ask our, our land managing agency partners to put in either planned projects current projects or finished projects. So that way we can all go to one basically place and map and see what people are doing to see how we can maximize the amount of funding where they're putting in a certain area 
uh, to, so we're not duplicating efforts so we can maximize our resources together. And it's something that we've had for a few years now and are really trying to ask a lot of our partners to, to utilize. So again, it's kind of almost a one-stop shop of what's going on across the state. And a lot of the questions that we're looking at and assessing in our planning is look at the strengths that we have and then plan and adapt to the changes. And once we come up with a plan and adaption to re-engage, but we also are asking ourselves and, and realizing that our work not only needs to be science informed, but also bringing back some of that cultural knowledge that we have. Looking at the past and how things were taken care of in the past, looking at a lot of dendrochronology data that happened um, back in the past and seeing what we can take from that to, to utilize within our management planning. We're also looking at for fire impacts, not fence lines. What's it doing across the landscape? Let's, don't, let's not care about the fence lines because fire doesn't care about it, so we shouldn't either. We need to plan across all boundaries. And then we need to recognize that our landscapes are changing. They are shifting in real time, and we need to adapt with that. As state agencies, we're not very good at doing that, and so that's something that we're trying to be flexible in and um, hopefully being innovative. Um, also, we recognize that prescribed burning is, is key to a lot of our management, and that's something that we're really trying to start implementing. Um, as a forestry division, we have a suppression statute, meaning we put all fires out. We're not allowed to... Um, purposefully start fires. So we're trying to find opportunities where we can utilize prescribed burning while still staying, staying within the confines of our statutory authorities. And then again, looking at the impacts and mortality from, from insects and disease. But really a lot of how we're trying to do this is asking ourselves a lot of questions and asking those questions in relation to our modeling. You know, we rely so much on models. There's tons of models out there, but a lot of them aren't changing as quickly to the changes um, that are coming about because of climate change. And a lot of times our thinking, our, our, our way of doing things, our schooling, our education sometimes are obsolete, obsolete in the sense that it takes time for academia to catch up to the current conditions. And by the time they do, it's already maybe a little too late because we're looking at something new, something on the landscape's different. So trying to really keep pace is a, is a tough thing. Um, that kind of falls in line with, are we adapting our strategies fast enough? Are we really reform, reforming or are we being stuck in the same rut of, well, we've always done it this way? That type of thinking isn't working. It's not going to work moving forward because things are changing. Um, things are going to continue to change and we need to be able to adjust and change with those, with those times and with those um, changes as they happen. And sometimes we just gotta ask ourselves, is really throwing money at the problem solving the problem? Is funding really the right answer? Is there something else we can do that doesn't involve funding that can help treat um, and combat the issues that we're looking at? So a lot of these types of questions is what we're asking our partners, what we're asking ourselves. And so these, these are the types of things that we're doing to hopefully help combat the future drought that's going to happen and continue to happen within the state. And with that, I yield. I know that was very quick, but <laughs> I, I thank you for your time and um, I can open for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for that presentation. And we have one in the chat. Remind us what that funding source, the FARWA, stands for. It's it's Forest and Watershed Restoration Act. It's it's uh, it's really two million that we get from from the state engineer's office every year, but then we supplement it with another pot of funding. So it's a little, the supplement is about one point three million. So it's about three, little over three million dollars of of recurring funding that we get, primarily targeted at projects that are focused in, in watershed areas. 
or water resource areas. And again, it can go pretty much run a gambit of um, anywhere from the planning component, like if you need to do NEPA, write a plan, all of that type of stuff on up to actual implementation. Um, thanks, Lindsay. Well, I think for time's sake, I think we should move on to Molly, but um, if anyone else has any questions, put them in the chat for Lindsay, and then also we'll have time um, to discuss as well if there's more questions, but thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to pass it on to Molly McCormick. So um, Molly is the program manager at the Fire Science Consortium, and um, yeah, I'll pass it to you, Molly. Go for it. Thanks, Lauren. Hey, everyone. Um, just to start, I know about half of you maybe, and I don't know some of you. So do you mind just putting in the chat um, what your affiliation is? And maybe if you've ever heard of the Southwest Fire Science Consortium. And Lindsay, I'm looking at you because I hope you say yes. I've never heard of it, Molly. <laughs> Lindsay sits on our board right now. <laughs> And Mark as well uh, is the PI for the Great Basin, our Great Basin sister. So hopefully he also puts yes. Um, okay, so I'll just put that. Is that someone have a step away? Okay, cool. Just looking at your responses here. Um, so what I'm going to do is take you on a tour of our website. I feel like that's the most effective way of showing you who we are. And that way, if I say something that catches your attention, you know how to find it later. And also, if you've heard of us, hopefully I will be showing you a lot of the things we've been creating that are new that maybe you haven't seen before. So um, hopefully this will be a good value of your time. So I'll share my screen here. Let me hide these controls here. Okay, does it look all right? Yeah, it looks good, Molly. You might want to zoom maybe just a little bit. It might be me being blind, but <laughs> that could help us just a little bit, probably. Is yeah. that a little better? That looks great, Molly. Thank you. Hopefully that'll... I might have to zoom as I go to different pages. So I just wanted to start here at firescience.gov because we get our funding from Joint Fire Science Program. And um, they fund research, but about 15 years ago or so, they decided that they realized that sometimes that research doesn't necessarily make it into the hands of the practitioners. So they created this Fire Science Exchange Network. And I already mentioned that Mark Brunson's on the call. He is PI for Great Basin and we're in the Southwest. So there's, no matter where you are, there's a Fire Science Exchange Network. Um, that you can go to for wildland fire information. And all of the things we create are, you can find on firescience.gov. So I'll go now to our website and um, I'm going to attempt to put a bunch of links in the chat so that you can follow along with me if you want. You could even zone out and go on your own journey through our website. Um, so here we go. We're going to start with our website. I'll zoom in again. Um, we operate through a board. We have um, researchers who are on the board and also rotating land managers who serve up to four year terms. Um, right now, this web page is a bit out of date. We've got a couple new folks joining us. Um, we have student members, so that's always an option for if you work with students, please let them know if you are a student, send me an email um, and we meet monthly. The big thing that we do is create educational products and also convene working groups, uh, workshops, conferences, etc. And um, it's really those in-person events that we're known for according to some social science that has been done on our consortium. So let's start there. We've had 
um, a lot going on this past couple of years because we received some additional money from the state of Arizona. So what I'm showing you is like what we do on steroids. We probably produce three times as much in the last year than we normally do. So there's a lot like fresh, there's a lot of fresh stuff on our website. We just finished the Arizona, sorry, the Arizona Tribal Fire and Climate Resilience Summit. Um, that was like a sister to sort of the New Mexico working group that Lindsay mentioned. We hope to combine them in some ways over time. And this is all about supporting tribal sovereignty and self-determination when it comes to working on reservation lands, but also ancestral homelands when it comes to thinning treatments and prescribed fire and suppression and all of the things. Um, coming up, we've got this Arizona Wildland Urban Interface Summit in December. This is to really talk about those issues in the WUI across our state. And then the big thing though is in November in Santa Fe, we have the Southwest Fire Ecology Conference. This only happens every four years. So for folks really interested in fire ecology, this is a really great event because everything is going to be relevant to the Southwest. We have field trips, we have workshops. Um, let me just put that link in the chat as well. If you don't know about it already, oops. So that's the link to our conference website. Um, and then we also occasionally do field trips. This year we've been doing tons of field trips associated with those in-person events. Um, we did a field trip last February to the Sonoran Desert to really look at this fire and invasion cycle. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other products we have on that topic here in a minute. Let's go to what we do. So we just produced a series of podcasts with Life with Fire. We're gonna, we have four produced right now. We have two more coming out. Um, and so I encourage you to listen to these. We asked um, people who have spent their careers in the Southwest to get interviewed and share their insights into really how the Southwest is changing in regards to climate change and fire in all of the ecosystems in the Southwest. So, it, you know, these podcasts can serve as great educational tools for folks who are new to the Southwest and are not working here. Or also, if you want to know about any of these roles and as far as how fire management is done here. So those are the podcasts that we just did. Um, I'm going to go now to our publications. Occasionally we do science syntheses, and these are deep dives into hot topics where we synthesize science um, so that students, land managers, whoever, don't have to like sift through a pile of journal articles on the topic. So these are really meant to, to be entry points into the topic and then folks can use the resources to go deeper. Some of our recent ones include managed wildfire. Managed wildfire can also be called fire, you know, natural ignition fire used for resource benefit. This is a really interesting uh, synthesis because it really digs into how managed wildfire is used and not used. And in the Southwest, we're pretty, it's kind of unique in that we do a lot more managed fire than many of the other regions of the country. And so we felt this was important for us to publish because it's a little bit more common here. And this is an interesting figure that we put together that sort of describes why this might be used and what the limitations are. So that's managed wildfire. Um, another thing that we do and we've been doing for the past 10 years is every year we put together a Southwest wildfire season overview. And this is a summary of the 10 most important fires of the Southwest, maybe in a given year, maybe that's because they were big, maybe it's because where they were or some of the aspects surrounding them. And we get this information off of NCWeb and other places. So we kind of just pull together any information that will, that exists on the fires. But then the important thing about this is because we've been doing it for 10 years, it's now this repository of fire history of the Southwest. Information from NCWeb and other government websites gets scrubbed over time. And so 
these end up being really important resources if you want to know about fires that happened many years ago. So I just wanted to point your attention to that. We also do fact sheets. Um, and these are short one pagers on topics. Sometimes they're related to some of our syntheses. Other times like this centering equity and justice in drought and wildfire planning came from a publication that we thought was really important, had some implications for the Southwest. And we asked the authors if we could create a fact sheet for them and they let us. This using wildfire visualization for mindful communication came out of a grad student project and is really about using high technology in a mindful way to discuss things that can be traumatic for people. So going out into the public, talking about wildfires, using high technology, but with that layer of being kind of sensitive to some of the information you might be presenting. And that's what this fact sheet's about. We have a fact sheet on new employee resources. So a lot of folks are hiring these days. You can give them this new employee resources fact sheet just to kind of say, this is what the consortium has for you. Spend your first week onboarding and check out some of these materials. And so you can check out um, some of these other fact sheets we have. This is a nice one, this best available science, because it describes, because a lot of folks get that guidance of, you know, during NEPA and planning, use best available science, but what does that mean? So we had a graduate student dig into what that means um, and how you can find best available science. So a little like go-to for folks who are mandated to look for best available science, but maybe not know what that means or where to get it. Um, let's see, so I think I'll go over into our fire ecology curriculum next. This started out as a place-based curriculum for middle school um, on fire ecology. It covers every ecosystem of the Southwest. It's based on science standards in both New Mexico and Arizona. And we have a team that goes around and conducts teacher trainings and classroom visits to use this curriculum. This was created a couple years ago and partners at the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management liked it so much they wanted us to develop it further into modules for classroom visits. So that's this like fire prevention staff going into a classroom and they can use these hands-on, really engaging, age appropriate, based on science standards lessons um, and really get the most out of their time. Um, we have now these classroom visits come with these trunks. So we've placed trunks throughout the Southwest. So if you're someone who gets asked to go to classrooms is interested in this, you can find a trunk sort of nearby and use it. And we have all kinds of trainings available, people to come out to you, all that. Uh, lots of support for use of this fire ecology curriculum. Because we realize that an informed public is one of the most important things we can have. And that's really what we're getting at here is helping folks understand some of the nuances and living with fire and prescribed fire in the Southwest. A couple other things I wanna point out before I go. We have travel grants available for attending workshops and field trips that we put on and also other things. So keep that in mind if you need support for education. And then finally, I want to point out our videos and webinars. So we have a YouTube channel that supports all of these things. We have webinar series um, that go on monthly, covering all kinds of topics. And we release little documentary videos, six to 10 minutes long. We just did one on preventing accidental ignitions uh, a case study on developed shooting ranges. So that one's an interesting one because we realized that people going out target shooting often cause fires. There's a cool thing that can happen where public lands can develop shooting ranges that are a little bit more fire safe. And we just wanted to show that as an option uh, to prevent accidental ignition. So now we have a video on that. Um, 
and we're getting ready to release a video of the restoration of Santa Clara Canyon. This is a beautiful story, heart-wrenching also, a story of how fires impacted Santa Clara Pueblo and what the folks there have done to rebuild the canyon. So as we produce new things, we put out a newsletter that comes out around quarterly. I put this sign up in the chat and we have, you know, our newsletter that distributes our latest and greatest. And also we share different things from partners around the Southwest. But this, I also wanted to point out to this group was we also do a quarterly research publications newsletter. And we go to like Web of Science and get all the recent publications relevant to the Southwest and fire. You can see we have a whole category on climate change here. So if you want to just kind of keep apprised of the science, um, I suggest sign up for a newsletter so you can get these in your inbox. I'm not sure if I have time for questions, but that's all I wanted to share with you guys today. Thank you for your time. So, thanks so much, Molly. Thanks for walking us through the website. That was really helpful um, to see in that way. So yeah, we have about two minutes for questions. So um, yeah, does anyone have any questions for Molly? Thanks if for the kudos, the claps and the cheers. I saw that you got. I, I was <laughs> just going to say, you know, I've worked with you before, Molly. I've known about the uh, the Fire Science Consortium for a long time, but I've never actually gone in and explored a lot of this. And so uh, walking us through it, like there's a ton of awesome stuff. Like I just have been like shooting links, like while you were talking, I'm like, oh, look at this. And I'm going and grabbing the link and sending it to different people I work with. So uh, super cool resource love how broad it is and how well thought out it is to like kind of equip people at different stages of their lives like in careers with the type of information that fits so kudos thanks oh thanks for that feedback john it's um i'll put that in our testimonials and send it back to joint fire science program <laughs> hi molly um i'm curious from the perspective of some of the fire managers that you're working with, what are some of the products that they're most excited about? You're working on so many things, but for managers and the people who are making these sort of on the ground decisions, um, yeah, what are they excited about and how are you responding to, to what they're saying? Yeah, a lot of times that's just the like place-based thing that we're doing. So those field trips, um, I didn't show one of our recent publications was a science synthesis on fire in the desert and invasive species. And that one, we've received so many comments from managers saying, thank you for the synthesis. I now have the evidence I need to hire the people I need to hire in order to manage these lands in the desert that are burning up and converting to grassland. So that's been really successful. Um, and I think just in general, the like, we get the, you know, random questions of like, we're treating in mixed conifer areas, what's your guidance? And we can send people to the, to a place and also say, yeah, let's, let's take a field trip there and get people together and talk about solutions and problems and gaps in knowledge. And so just, it's more, I think of all of these things we create as widgets that promote relationship building and networking to help people feel like they're not alone to make science-based decisions together. That's really what we're trying to do. Awesome. Thanks so much, Molly. That was really, really helpful and really awesome to see. I agree with John. I, there are some things that I definitely have known about the organization and there's some things like that I wrote down too. I need to check that out. So um, thanks so much for sharing and um, being here. So I'm going to move on to um, my presentation really quickly. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it not too much time so we can really kind of dive into doing some discussion. I think that would be really valuable today. So I'm going to share, here's the link to Frida here, and then I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so I'm going to give you guys the abbreviated um, Frida presentation. Does everyone see in my screen? Cool. Thanks, Molly. Um, so yeah, so I'm I'm Lauren. I work with the Southwest Climate Hub and 
um, kind of one of our work streams that we work in at the Southwest Climate Hub is tool development. Um, and so we have this capability to develop tools and share this for share this with foresters and ranchers and folks who need this information on the ground. Um, and but what we've been hearing from folks is that there's so many tools available. There's so many awesome things out there. It just can be really hard to find them. A lot of these tools are um, created with limited coordination. Um, there's not always lasting funding to keep these tools going. Um, and generally, there's just there's just too much to find and too much to search the internet um, over. And so, at the hub, we work to create um, the Forest Resource Index for Decisions in Adaptation or FRIDA. Um, this project was a collaboration with the Southwest and South Central Climate Adaptation Science Centers. Um, and overall, I put that link there in the chat. But basically, FRIDA is really an online one-stop shop place to be able to find any kind of resource you might need for um, forest management in specifically New Mexico and Arizona. So um, currently, um, this tool, Frida, is currently available specifically for New Mexico and Arizona, um, and you can see that reflected in the tools available. Um, however, there's some, some talk about expanding it a little bit as well to, to other regions. Um, but overall, um, Frida is searchable, so any user can really easily query based on your needs or your objectives or the place that you're working in. Um, it's region-specific. As I mentioned, um, these resources really curated to focus on New Mexico and Arizona and the broader southwestern region of the United States. And then what's nice about this tool shed is it's updated frequently. So thanks to our partners at the Hornada Experimental Range, we have some awesome computer science folks um, who are able to keep this tool updated um, and it can be hosted, it's hosted on um, the Climate Hub's website so that it's available and will be continued to be updated by Climate Hub staff in the future. Um, and finally, the tool is really user focused. Um, so um, this tool shed is for resource managers, foresters, um, decision makers, anyone kind of stewarding the forests of the Southwest um, that need resources. And so I'm going to go in and show you, let's see here. I'm going to just show you what Frida looks like. Are you guys seeing that change? Cool. Okay, so this is the front page of Frida. Um, and so as you scroll all the way down, um, these are all these resources that are available within Frida. Um, and so you can go in and you can use the search bar, which is smart. So as you start typing, if I want to type drought, it starts to give you some keywords. Um, so that's one way you can search. So you could search drought. I spelled it wrong, <laughs> but you can search drought and then you get all of these resources down here. Um, but another way to search for resources are by these topics. So we have the, these four main topic areas here. Right here, I think we have 36 topics. And so making sure all these filters are cleared here. Um, say you're really interested in looking at funding or any kind of funding sources, you can select that topic and scroll down. And these are the resources that would be associated with funding. Um, you can go ahead and clear your filter again um, and say you're really interested in looking at fuels management. Um, and then maybe we want to look specifically in New Mexico. So this is where this region filter comes in and you can select um, a state here. So here's again where all those resources come up. And so these numbers within parentheses here just represent how many resources are available within that filter. And so as you can see by the numbers here, again, Arizona and New Mexico are really, um, really the focus here, but some of these tools included are also available nationally or available in other regions, and that's where kind of these other regions come up. Um, but this makes it really easy to really kind of specifically search a region or a state. Um, and then another filter that we added is platform. So right now, these are the platforms that are included in Frida. So we have case studies or fact sheets or journal articles, um, tools, even other toolkits um, that are um, helpful as well. Um, and you can specifically search for that. I think that's helpful um, to be able to specifically search for kind of what kind of platform you're looking at. And then finally, actually, this was uh, Molly's suggestion when she first looked at Frida. Um, but we um, early on, we kind of added this vegetation type filter within Frida um, to be able to um, select a specific vegetation type that you're working in. So you can look at resources specifically in a mixed conifer forest or an aspen forest or things like that. Um, and, and once you click on a resource, um, so let's say 
uh, we want to click on this resource. So once you click on it, it pulls up this window. This is where you can see kind of what kind of what kind of tool or resource this is, the keywords associated with it, um, the topic, the vegetation type, um, all of those filters that we talked about, the year it was published, the authors, the citation, um, a brief description about that resource, and then that direct link to be able to find it. And then finally, at the very bottom of Frida, um, we included this comments and feedback form. So again, this is kind of Frida 1.0. Frida was um, introduced, I think, in October of last year. So it's been out for a while, but um, it's still, still fairly new and we're still hoping to get some feedback from users and folks to make it um, the most accessible tool shed. Um, so there's this comment and feedback form. So this takes you directly to a Google form um, that will go to my email um, where you can suggest maybe existing resources that aren't in Frida yet, um, maybe um, an edit or a change to an existing resource um, or any kind of additional comments or suggestions, maybe suggesting um, another place that Frida would be helpful. Um, so this is a really great, um, great way to be able to share that input directly with me. And of course, you're always welcome to email me as well. Um, but I think that's, yeah, that's Frida. Does anyone have any questions?